Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Lucy, for inviting me this afternoon. Um, essentially, um, what I'm going to do is just give a kind of update report on the reconnaissance and prospection surveys done for one part of HS2 during the last several years, uh, and then look at what additional value we can get out of that survey data beyond the prospection. The, you know, the target of the survey is obviously to find stuff, uh, but as we gather more and more larger data sets, uh, I'm going to suggest there's a, there's a good value in taking that data a little bit further uh, and reusing it. So, phase one of HS2, in case you've been uh, on Mars or something, uh, runs from London to Birmingham and the central section contract which I've been delivering for uh, Fusion Joint Venture runs just from a bit of Warwickshire in uh, just outside Salem. It's about 100 kilometres, a little bit more and about 32 square kilometres of land required for the scheme. So, just to recap, we essentially started the project design back in 2017 um, and we spent most of the second half of 2017 and 2018 doing geophysical surveys. In fact, that went on a lot longer due to all the problems you can imagine with land access and, you know, getting a bit of a survey done and having to come back later and finish it. So, essentially, geophysical surveys have been carrying on almost entirely through that timeline. Um, but we're now in 22 at the PXA stage, we're writing up reports. And what I'm just going to go through uh, today is kind of make you aware, really, of the, the kind of data sets being developed for the project, because, of course, it's a public project that's all going to be available for reuse uh, and reinterpretation, potentially. So, the project, this goes from bottom to top, this diagram, but essentially in terms of the desk study level surveys collected for the, the project area, including aerial photographic interpretation on all available images, soil surveys, geotechnical works, the PAS, the HER, the Roman Rural Settlement Project, very important resource uh, for us as part of the baseline, and also the work done by um, the Englade project. Just draw attention to those. Uh, I think they're really useful when you start to look at these large scale uh, surveys as part of the baseline. Now, overlaid on top of that is the remote sensing data sets. Now, LIDAR has been collected at 200 millimeter uh, resolution for the entire scheme, so that's been very important to us. Uh, hyperspectral data, which uh, Nick was referring to, is um, also collected for the entire scheme. And then what I'm going to talk about today is the magnetometry, gradiometer mostly, data that has been added to that. So there's a multiple um, layered resource here for this entire scheme area, uh, which I think is one of the benefits of a project like this, if that data can then be reused, made publicly available. Um, just a word on, on assessment of other zones, like Nick was referring to, alluvial environments, but also woodlands, were dealt with by different methods. So we're just going to look today at the, the magnetometer data that really uh, was aimed at the, the, the near surface remains across largely agricultural land. Um, then, just on the top right there, which I'll refer to later, we termed parts of the magnetometer results as no data areas. These were often largest areas where there apparently wasn't a lot of archaeological activity. This is quite significant, especially to local authority curators um, who challenged us to demonstrate why that magnetometer data, magnetometer data and the other data sets could be relied on alone. And of course, it can't necessarily be. So there's a series of testing needed on these no data areas. So, just the geology. 
the, the bedrock geology. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to draw a line across these different geologies of southern Midlands, uh, fortuitous and potentially interesting in terms of comparing results against those. In terms of the superficial, we've got a couple of areas of significant alluvium, three or four river valleys intersect the route, a higher ground area of till uh, with some fluvial glacial deposits as well uh, in the centre. That's just a background. A lot of the route as well characterised by very heavy clay soil. So, what was our baseline? In terms of the OS master map, uh, <coughs> we looked at the topographic uh, feature, layers, and extracted everything that was potentially surveyable. Yeah? That wasn't development, that wasn't water, wasn't woodland, and largely was going to be nice, flat agricultural fields that magnetometer survey would do well on. 2,700, slightly more, and this number, if you notice it changes, it does change. It's something around 2,700, 2,800 he hectares of survey for magnetometry. So, we set off to survey that, as I said, over several years. Um, walking, pushing and pulling, various bits of kit. Uh, all pretty much done with gradiometer, although there were some cesium magnetometers as well in use. Uh, at the scale, we're going to look at the results. I don't think that makes a lot of difference, but again, an interesting comparison on similar parcels of land, adjacent parcels of land, to look at those two separate bits of kit and how they performed uh, as a future study. Um, the important thing about the data collection is that HS2 specified the data schemas for every single survey. So for uh, magnetometry work in partic particular, the data collection uh, template set out with controlled vocabulary so that we can pull together surveys from different suppliers all into a single layer at the end of the day with, with pretty much ease, actually. And that's not too common in archaeology that we've got this kind of data standard um, being available <laughs> across different suppliers' work is something else to talk about is, is the excavation data and how we haven't really achieved concordance with that yet to compare and contrast different bits of work. Just taking the, the results as a whole, something like 150,000 anomalies recorded by the four teams. Um, a huge majority, three quarters of those, some form of magnetic disturbance. Um, in terms of probable or possible archaeology, about 6% of the anomalies across the 32-kilometre the area were identified as probable archaeology. Another class in the uncertain, which could be archaeology, another 6%. So about 12% of all the anomalies on this scheme were identified as worthy of further investigation. In fact, what we've done is pretty much taken a, uh, a holistic view to the follow-up evaluation of these results. So, we've got some very, very clear sites. I'm not going to show you any grayscales today. I'm sure you some disappointment, perhaps, in the audience. Uh, but we've only got a short amount of time. So, some very clear sites with, with good spatial definition and form. This example here at Wormleaton, large Romano-British, uh, later Iron Age Romano-British farmstead group and some other <coughs> earlier prehistoric features as well, versus the type of result which you kind of look at and think, well, yeah, it's rather poorly spatially defined. There's certainly anomalies, but they're not making a lot of sense. Now, this is the mixture of, of the data. So, as I said, we're able to map that across the entire 100 kilometres and create a single data set. Um, the trial trench evaluation followed up these surveys. So these were largely selected on a, what was actually a fixed uh, percentage available to us, which was 50% of the geophysical surveys by area. So we selected for the 
uh, high resolution trenching, those areas that were subject to trial trenching based on these results and the other data sets. Um, then various areas for open area stripping and recording were defined uh, as mitigation areas, example there. And then we come back to those areas that weren't selected for trenching but could nonetheless contain uh, significant evidence and how are we going to test those. Okay, so just looking at the effectiveness of the magnetometer surveys across the project, we found that 59% of archaeological anomalies were located in the mitigation areas, indicating that following trench evaluation, not a lot changed between the initial picture the magnetometer is giving and the defined, identified areas for detailed investigation. What, on the other end of the, the graph, the uncertain anomalies, by and large, did not turn into mitigation sites and did not follow up through trenching to identify significant archaeology. So the interpretation at the original survey level by these guys, which you'd expect four top companies undertook this work. But so this is you know what you'd expect, and it's just interesting to be able to look at such a large data set and see, well, is it true? Are our assumptions about what we see in the grayscale uh, on day one, when you see it, you always have a gut feeling. Are they, are they correct? Pretty much so, is what we found. Uh, so, I mentioned the no data areas, and this is generally some numbers, I won't go into them, regarding how much survey was done and what was done to it. We end up with about 31%. Uh, of um, geophysical surveys that weren't looked at. Uh, so let's go back and have a look at them. To do that, we used a piece of work by Ruth Waller, where, which she published back in 2008, 2011, which was trying <coughs> to take great literature results and say, can we, can we relate these archaeological results to the landscape? Yeah, across different uh, criteria. We took that and we, there's the reference by the way, probably running out of time now. We took that and we said okay for this scheme we'll kind of re-engineer a land suitability model and then we'll compare how these different scores uh, of favourability, so you can just see the scores down there on the right hand columns, in some cases it's just a single score, in other cases it's graduated. But essentially, we took that information from each land parcel and retrospectively, admittedly, gave that uh, land suitability score to, to the whole scheme. Uh, and in this case, we see the high point there on the blue bar is where there's a tendency for these mitigation sites to fall within one of those categories. Yeah? The 200 to 250 score line. I don't know this is significant yet. This is just introducing the idea to you uh, that using the, the survey data and looking at the landscape uh, to develop this kind of model, can we produce something useful at the end of it? Yeah? I don't know if that's correct, but that's the initial outcome, is there seems to be a correlation with this land suitability score uh, and the actual presence of archaeological remains. Not taken into account at all on that graph period, of course which is why the analysis and this question is going to get complicated at the post x stage, but I hope that happens. Um, mentioned geology as well. We've started mapping the false negatives and true positives, as shown by intrusive work, follow on intrusive work, where, where have we, we're really identifying uh, no archaeology present versus we are. And we're starting to map in particular sites uh, that we're getting a lot of false negatives. Yeah? Magnetometer shows nothing. Actually, there's a whole bunch of archaeology that's not showing up. When we map those to the bedrock geology, we're starting to see trends as well. That certain bedrock geologies are, are repeatedly producing um, false positives. Uh, and that slide just shows the very first uh, part of this analysis. We've only done 23 sites. We've got about 100 to do. 
ultimately. Uh, so, in terms of the data, the, I think the most interesting thing uh, is how we tackle the, um, the false negatives. Yeah? And one of the things we're going to hear from Roger later on in the session uh, is to start trying to combine with the magnetometer work at the same resolution, i.e. pretty much 100% of your scheme area, some other methodologies which uh, can go alongside the magnetometry at the same scale. And Roger's going to talk to us about the geochemical prospection uh, that he's been doing for us on this scheme later on. Uh, but essentially, overcoming those false negatives through, through using more than just the magnetometry. And then developing these land suitability or favorability models with access to real data. It's re-engineering, but I think it's very, uh, it's not often done. The resources are often not there for it. So a project like HS2, we've got to take advantage and really try and make it happen. Uh, and Schemes start very quickly, and quite often the work that goes into really understanding that landscape isn't there before you're told to hit the ground with a, with a survey, and you haven't necessarily done the legwork to understand the geomorphology particularly. So let's focus on that as well earlier on in any future schemes. That's my contribution. Thank you very much.